Uh, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Fireman's Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on live shows. Um, because if, if you don't want a gun, I don't want you running a gun. If you're not comfortable with that, don't don't own one. I, you know, I wouldn't call you an asshole, but I would just call you, you know, you're straight up. You're honest. And that's what we need. That's later. That's later. We got to bait them with the gun stuff. <laughs> this is the After Action Project, and we're bringing you the student's perspective on firearms training. This is the podcast that takes you inside the eyes of the student and the mind of the instructor, from practical to tactical, medical to legal, and everything in between. If there's a course for it, this is your fly on the wall after action destination. This is the After Action Project. If you like what we're doing and you'd like to ha- and would like to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash after action project. If you'd like to throw us some free support and appreciation, we would greatly appreciate a five-star review on iTunes or anywhere else you want to share this with your friends and family. Tonight's episode, just like every episode, is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. Be sure to check out the other great podcasts on the Firearms Radio Network by visiting firearmsradio.tv. Tonight, we are joined by Carrie Sloan of Stilettos and Shotguns and WeTheFemale.net. Um, so it's, it's been a few weeks since we've been on here. Andy, why don't you um, go ahead and, and tell us what you've been up to, if, uh, if you've done any shooting, any of that good stuff, and, and what you have coming up over the next couple of weeks. Oh, man, I've been a, I haven't been to the range in actually in a little while, other than we, did, we went and shot some clays the other day, which that was a blast. Just a little bit different from, you know, handgun training and all that stuff, so... Uh, I got my instructor cert uh, here a few months ago, so I just want to stay sharp on shooting shotguns so I don't look like a total fool when I go out with somebody that doesn't know, you know what I mean? And um, I don't know if you saw my banner on the bottom, Ice Fishing Champion. I tried ice fishing for the first time this last weekend. That was fun. It was interesting. Didn't catch absolutely nothing, but, you know, hey, it was cool. And uh, next week, uh, we got a concealed carry class here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So if you're here in Albuquerque, come check us out, Practical Defense Training. That's about it. Yeah, that should be a good class. Um, did you fall on the ice? I'm, I'm always, uh, when I was younger, I went to, did some ice fishing up in Wisconsin, but, uh, you know, that was a couple hundred pounds ago for years. <laughs> so, you know what we do, man? I mean, as gun guys, we always buy all the crap. So, I mean, I bought, I researched, went on YouTube, like looked at a ton of videos, and then we went to the marina right by the lake, and I bought a little fishing pole that was like, this big and they're like this is the best fishing pole ever we bought shoe spikes and i mean heaters and you name it we bought i'm way over prepared as usual and like it like a typical gun guy you bought all of the equipment but didn't train oh yeah absolutely (laughs) had no idea what the hell i was doing i mean i know how to fish but i've never fished on a 12 inches of ice and you know listening to that ice crack underneath you for the first time it's a it's a different little sound man it's like wow, this is a little weird, but the guy's like, dude, we could literally drive a diesel on top of that ice and it's not cracking. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm pretty heavy, man. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Carrie? Have you, have you ever ice fished? No. No. <laughs> Hell no. No, Hell. I, no. This, I, I don't like being cold. Like, I live in Washington State, and when my daughter goes to college, I'm out. I'm moving. I, I literally want to be a, a sunbird. I want to live six months out of the year in Florida and six months out of the year in Arizona. Mm-hmm. So I am, uh, no, I don't I don't like being cold. I'm over it. I so <laughs> cannot wait to get no. the fuck out of here. Oh, no. <laughs> um, we have a sound bite. No. Yeah. No. That is the... Uh... <laughs> That is the official sound bite for this podcast. That's just going to be the first two <laughs> two uh, two minutes of intro looping out once we get this published and and produced and all that good stuff. Um, so, Carrie, why don't you talk to us a little bit about some some things that you do enjoy uh, doing, specifically firearms, and um, give us a little bit of, of your background in the firearms industry and and what has brought you to where you are at today with stilettos and shotguns and and we the female. So I'm. Okay, but before we came on, you told me that we were talking about cocaine and hookers. That's later. So, that's later. We got to bait them with the gun stuff. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. So, okay. Then, that's the after show. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Oops, and you sorry. can't have cocaine and hookers without guns. So, I mean, it all circles somewhere, right? <laughs> well, yeah. So, that's my retirement plan. So, put a pin in that and I'll tell you guys nice. about it. So, I, I mean, I don't know where you want me to Where do you want me to start? Back in the day when I was like a young girl. 
<laughs> yeah, talk to, maybe talk to us about the, the first time you went out and you, you shot um, and, and kind of where you are right now with with, with We the Female and uh, changing victim mentality through defensive mindset and situational awareness. Sure. I So, I mean, I shot as a kid. You know, I mean, my grandfather was – my grandfather was legit, like, Wild West stuff. Like, he was born and raised in Midland, Otex, uh, Mid, Midland Odessa, Texas. Um, uh, he was um, – my family had, um, and I, I mean like the real, not the bush kind of crap or any of that, but you know, we, they settled there because they had hit some oil and they certainly enough just to, to make a living on, right. Not nothing to be, you know, wealthy or anything, but that's how they ended up there. Um, my grandfather was, was certainly a maverick of his day. He was one of the first, um, uh, first, uh, topless bar owners in Texas, um, like, and by then, by that, I mean like pasties, right. And, you know, back in the fifties and sixties, uh, so guns were always a part of my, my life around me, you know, and we, they were always, everything was loaded, unlocked and just everywhere, you know, around the house. We didn't think anything of them. So I'd shot some shotguns and rifles as a kid, but, um, and a, and a revolver, but, uh, nothing semi-automatic cause he was old West. I mean, he had them, but that was usually because he took them from people that owed him money, but that's a different story. That's a different podcast. But uh, um, so he, um, oh, just hit my cord. so he, uh, being around them has never been a thing. So fast forward a few years, <clears throat> like maybe 30, and um, married my husband who is, he's active duty. And, and so we've had guns around and I have PTSD um, from my ex-husband who uh, beat the hell out of me, which is why I started uh, We the Female, I'm a domestic violence survivor. And, um, I, lots of things that I could, we'll get into some of this, I'm sure. But, um, one of the things that helped with the nightmares, mitigating the nightmares was we bought a shotgun and put it on the rail, on a rail, just beside my bed. So I could literally just reach down and grab it. And just knowing that I had that there helped to, to a little bit with the nightmares. So, um, I've always been pro 2A. Um, I'm very, I'm actually very much a hardline constitutionalist. I'm anti-political party completely and if you follow me on social media at all you would know i mean you see it because i call yes, steve fisher just texted me <laughs> so if he's watching this <laughs> hey steve oh yeah you're uh, miss, you're missing the comments in the oh, chat am I? oh yeah in the comments being oh yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> up, uh, i was he talking about my hair he likes oh i'm not seeing all, i'm not seeing it on there I don't yeah. see the comments on there. So, I mean, I see comments, but not Steve's. Anyway, um, so I, uh, yeah, so I, um, that's that started kind of the gun ownership in the house. Um, went and bought my first pistol, which was um, my, still my everyday carry. Her name is Abigail Adams. I carry a, a P238. And um, she's a great little 380. People tease me about it, carrying a 380, and then they shoot it. And if you've ever shot a, a 238, you would know that they're, pretty like most of them, like my big guys are like all right and then they shoot they're like oh this is really nice i'm like yeah <laughs> so um yeah that's that's kind of kind of my background i guess really so um i we have here in washington state 1639 i mean if you're in the gun community at all uh, and not living under a rock you've heard of that it made national news it was very very controversial and very restrictive and um, the short of that is I spoke out against it as a domestic violence victim, particularly the mental health background check that happens when you sign your 4473, which I didn't know what that was a year ago. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know what the name of it was or what they call it. <clears throat> and um, they, uh, uh, you know, now when you sign that here, it's an automatic waiver of your HIPAA rights, your medical records. So that. Wow. State, yeah. So the state has complete access to all of your medical records, including your mental health records. Um, and it's completely they can look at anything they want. They can look as much as they want. There's there's the mental health authority is who um, uh, who looks at it. Well, we don't there's we don't even know what that is. Um, there's no criteria for what they'll approve, not approve, you know. Um, so medications that are used for other things that are classified as antidepressants can get you denied. Um, but of course, the big one being PTSD, which is a buzzword for gun control, as we know, um, and typically related to uh, veterans. But uh, it's also a big thing for um, for domestic. Well, everybody. Right. I mean, really, any anybody can have PTSD from something. But um, one of the, the hidden uh, components of that is is domestic violence. And a lot of people don't talk about that. Um, so 
that I am sitting literally in a position every day now because that is on my my medical my, my medical record from 13 years ago where I could walk in and be denied a firearm because it's there. Now it's not happened yet, fortunately, um, but that it could. <clears throat> um, I won't go to my doctor and take medications now. Like I won't take sleeping meds or, um, you know, anxiety meds or any of that kind of stuff because I, I can't risk risk that. So we have this whole situation now where you have people, I mean, there's many, many reasons why <clears throat> red flag laws are bad. Or these type of laws are bad, particularly for domestic violence victims. But um, more than anything, with something like this, you end up in a situation where people aren't going to go get the health care that they need, mental health care that they need, because they don't want to be this on their record or be denied, or then be put into the higher incident for red flagging kind of thing. Because let's be realistic, we know that that's going to happen. So that's that's it's creating a, a situation that we that they're trying to say that they're mitigating. And that started cluing into, so I've, I've, I've been a teacher of situational awareness, defensive mindset for a while. Um, I can do threat assessment, you know, you know, those types of things. And, uh, uh, but it, as I started teaching these classes and I started seeing all of these things, I started watching all of these connections to this culture of victim mentality that we have, which interestingly enough is never denied by anybody in any political party. Like everybody agrees we all have this culture of victim mentality. <clears throat> but what I started noticing is how through social media, um, politicians actually use social media, I believe. Um, and, and it's this victim mentality is continued to be perpetuated and almost encouraged uh, and supported through social media and 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 law uh, legislation and particularly gun control legislation. So they keep telling us that they want us, you know, that they they're they're enacting these laws to keep us safe. Uh, particularly with domestic violence, right? They tell you hide in the closet till they get there, you know, whatever, right? All these, I could go on, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, and so I started making all these connections. I'm like, okay, so they're continuing to cultivate and perpetuate victim mentality, particularly among women and domestic violence survivors. Uh, and with the more of this legislation they keep putting in place, this is going to continue. How do we break that? We break that through educating people, particularly like women, because women are a powerful force at home. They, right. We, we have more of an influence because y'all know who's running the house and home. let's be realistic, gentlemen. <laughs> no argument here. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Come that's on. right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, and if Steve is watching, he's like, that's why I'm single. <laughs> 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 Mr. Crotchety. He's my favorite crotchety old man. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, uh, um, when we can get in through these types of classes and teach, uh, we can start to break the culture of victim mentality through teaching them defensive mindset. Um, it, it, some of the things I've learned in the classes that I taught were, were women say, yeah, when I was out, you know, my husband tells me I'm overreacting or I'm being paranoid, right? Because we're taught to trust our instincts. Um, and that's, a, that's pretty common, particularly among our culture, right? We tend to be a little bit more aware always as, as gun owners, but um, women are taught that, right? Always trust your instinct that we call them the woman feelers on the back of the neck, right? Um but then we're and then it's dismissed, and then we're taught that we're overreacting or we're paranoid. <clears throat> so I really get in, and I told one woman in one class, I said, maybe you need to evaluate who you're married to, if he's if he's being that adamant in the whole room because it was 61 women. That was my biggest class. It was in Colorado, and the whole room you could hear it. It went, you hear the, <gasps> and I, I said, I'm sorry, but that's if if you're sitting here continuing to tell me over and over and over again that your husband says this to you, and you can't let it go. That says to me that there's something else going on in your home that you need to evaluate, you know, bottom line. So that those are the moments that started hitting. I'm like, OK, the minute that we can teach women simple things that it goes beyond parking under the lights, at, at you know, the lights at night at Walmart, right? You're getting in your car and locking the door. It's how many exits are in that Walmart? Do you have a plan to get out? What if your family is at a baseball game? Where are the exits? Right. You may you may say, oh, if we get lost, meet by this you know, hot dog stand. Right. Or whatever. But what does that mean in a crisis situation when everybody's running? Right. Where are all those exits? Where's your where's your exit strategy everywhere? Right. You get those maps for Disneyland. Most people look at it for the next ride, but they're not looking at it for where these other exits are and where they can get out. So what I began to notice is as we begin to teach women this, they start to become more confident. And the more confident they become, the less dependent they become. And so now we start using this as a means to break the, the culture of victim mentality 
which then allows us to become less dependent upon the government to protect us because they've literally told us that they're not going to protect us. I mean, SCOTUS has actually ruled on that. So, um, and that's, that's kind of how we get in. And then we talk about, you know, with that component being arm the women. I don't, two things. I'm a hardline constitutionalist. I'm a history geek. And when the, the founding fathers wrote right to bear arms, they didn't write it that right. It's not bear, right to bear guns. It's right to bear arms, which is any and all means of an individual's ability to defend themselves um, and their home and their property um, from, uh, you know, danger, uh, criminals or the government. So, in fact, side note of that, I think it would behoove the gun culture uh, to change their language about right to bear arms, about being just guns <clears throat> and start encompassing it as a more holistic approach, because it's a little bit harder to legislate arms as opposed to guns. Right. So, um, yeah, so we teach them, you know, rights and responsibilities around that, what options are. Um, because if, if you don't want a gun, I don't want you owning a gun. If you're not comfortable with that, don't, don't own one. You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt you. It's it's, and then you're going to, then they're going to have more reasons to legislate, but whatever method you choose to defend yourself and, and accept personal responsibility for your own safety, train with it, learn it and, and make it your own. And um, that's that's kind of how we how I made the connection to figure out how we can start breaking this culture of victim mentality. And then we can teach our daughters and our sons. Right. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. We're not going to do it overnight. But um, if we can get 20 people in a class each time, you know, across the country, uh, that's 20 people that are going to go out and teach their friends. Right. And then it's going to become that butterfly effect. So what is it? A lot. No, that's, that's, that's good, because the less I talk, the longer our listeners and our viewers stay tuned in. Uh, <laughs> the longer I stay tuned in, that's yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so what is what is a seminar, what does a class look like? Um, how long is it? Uh, who's who's the student? Um, and talk to us a little bit about that. So what I have found and what I'm trying to to move toward, I really and I had something big happen this year that um, that is going to help with that, which I'm excited about. But um, it, the, last year through the year, it was gun. I know a lot of gun store owners. And so they were and of course, they're very receptive to it. So they they would bring me in. Um, my class can be used as a CCW class, which is great. Um, I just insert the um, most states. It's it's acceptable um, for the for the classroom work of it. Um, we just insert the laws for whatever state I'm in. Um, but I, I talk about, uh, victim mentality, what, what it is, um, because we think we know, and then understanding what it is, is a whole different thing. I talk about the connections like I did here a little bit more in depth. Um, I have some examples, um, that I put up there. Um, you know, recently we just had right after Thanksgiving here in Washington, we had a woman who had left her abusive husband he told her, if you leave me, I'm going to kill you. Um, he was red flagged, surrendered his guns, and she ended up shot in the parking lot of the elementary school picking up her children uh, because he obtained a gun. I mean, there's all kinds of like it was the trifecta, literally, of, of failed legislation. Right. She had a restraining order. Uh, he had been red flagged. He still obtained a firearm and he was in a gun free zone. So it was like the perfect storm. Of, of things that they tell you are going to keep you safe. And, and of course they didn't. Um, so I, I have some of those stories in there. Some where women have died, some that haven't. I'm actually adding the church shooting in because that's a whole other thing. And, and if you guys have time, I'd love to talk about that because there's a whole component of that that I'm really trying to bring awareness to that isn't as acknowledged as it should be. Um, and we can get in that in a little while if you want. But um, that's going to be added to my, my thing about what it looks like to be prepared and the significance of being prepared. Um, and then we go into just like basically the kind of it's a one on one. Right. I mean, you can bring me people can bring me back in. And the people in Colorado are when I did that class of 61. Um, some of them want me back to do layers, deeper layers. But I talk about how do we you know, how do we start to, to retrain our mind? Right. What kind of exercises do we go through in our minds? I talk about um, fundamental identification of threat. Um, we go through the colors, right, which I added black to mine because most people don't add black to theirs, but it's important to understand where you don't want to get to, right, with sensory, you know, lockout and and things. And, you know, it's funny to hear the women giggle. I'm like, you ever heard that saying? I was so scared I shit myself. And they're like, eh, 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 eh. and I'm like, that's it right there. Like that, that's, there's a reason that statement is there. And it's a mm -hmm. reason it's literally classified in 
in these, these colors that, and, and, you know, the, I forget there's a name for that. I never remember what it is, but um, we don't ever want to get here. So we do, we're going to do all this to not ever have to get to here. And so we talk about what those things look like in depth. Um, and, and, and even, you know, people's body language, we talk about how to read body language. We talk about watching people posture and what it looks like when people are doing that, which means how aggressive they're going to be and how you can react with that. Um, and then we talk about, uh, the family thing, like I talked about the Disneyland, that's a big one. That's usually, there's never been a single person in any class, even the, the most seasoned people that have come to my class and they're like, Psh, I got this. Well, I know this shit, you know, whatever. The minute I bring up the, the family plan thing, there's never been a single person. And I've taught at this point, probably close to 200 people that haven't gone. Oh, I, I didn't think about that. So that's usually a big one that gets people. So we end up spending some time on, on family plans um, and preparedness. And then we talk about options for self-defense, um, super light. We don't go into that a lot because it's not about leading with the gun. It's not about leading with a knife. It's about this is your, always your plan A, always your plan A. And what do we need to do to exercise this, to make this muscle memory like you would drawing or using a knife or any sort of hand, hand to hand. Um, and then the other component I spend the most time on is the rights and responsibilities surrounding self-defense. Um, we, it, I believe, I fiercely believe in shall not be infringed. I mean, I'm like, I'm pretty much sure I'm flagged by the FBI because I'm pretty hard line. Like I'm like, stay off my goddamn lawn and you have no, like my daughter is that way. I mean, she's, she ain't getting married. Cause she's like, I don't need to pay the government to tell me who I'm going to marry. I mean, like <laughs> we're pretty, <laughs> I'm really proud. Don't worry y'all. I got your future. It's cool. <laughs> There's hope for the future. They're in my, my teenager and her friends. We're good. Um, so we're pretty hard line about that. I do believe, however, that we need to be responsible within our own culture to not give them a reason mm -hmm. to, uh, to, um, to infringe upon us. And there's, there's twofold reason for that. One, it's our effing responsibility as human, decent human beings to be responsible with the, with self-defense tools that are deadly bottom line. That's just a fundamental human decency and, and morality issue. Second, um, when we can get to a point where we can stop being assholes um, to to people outside of the gun culture, anti-gun people, and with, to each other within our in our own community, and get together and come up with some cohesive fucking plan for what that looks like, and we start to mitigate crime from the inside because we're self-policing, now politicians have no reason to say that they need to put gun control in place. So when they continue to do it, which we know they will, now we have valid reason to say, hey, we've got statistics showing that we've been able to mitigate this by self-policing our own culture and our own community. What's the real reason that you want to take these guns away from us? Now we have a better marketing plan, for lack of a better term, to come in and say, uh-uh, now we know what your intention is, right? Because now they can still hide behind it because we can't get our shit together. So um, that that's a big, that would be huge, right? I mean, if we could actually come up, like my dream... <laughs> unrealistic dream is to have this awesome like marketing plan that everybody, every gun owner could like subscribe to that would, you know, mitigate the guns falling into the wrong hands or whatever. And, and that, so then we can be like, eh, politicians. Now we know you're out of here. Yeah. Even <laughs> bigger than that, that, even bigger uh -huh. than that, getting, getting the people that are not gun owners in to listen to the same thing that you're talking about. I right. think that's huge. And uh, I think you really have something here because you know, so much we talk about guns. We talk about guns. We love guns. We right. love to shoot and all that. You know, but people with PS PTSD, women that have been battered, have been in serious situations, they're they're not quite ready for that hardcore gun. Some are, you know, but many aren't. You know, I I grew up. I had a pretty tough tough life, and uh, you know, my father had a history of that with my mother, and you know, I I seen my mother growing up as a kid, you know, and her being deathly afraid of them. Not even you know, not even too thrilled about guns today. She's not against them, but you know. Know, people aren't ready for that and so right. um having teaching what you're teaching is it, it goes so much beyond just weapons and guns right you're given you're given people hope of a mindset of how do i get how do i get past what i'm going through how do i not get into the mix of of what she's talking about how do i keep myself out of it that confidence and i think that's i think that's really great so let me ask you this carrie um is this a is this a course towards women more or is it for anybody who's it for 
so it, my, my initial plan, being a, a female domestic violence uh, victim and, and knowing that that number is significantly higher than males, I knew that it existed for males, but I mean, it's, it's quite a bit higher. Um, one in three or four women, depending on the statistic you look at, and one in seven men. One in seven men tends to be pretty consistent across the board. I've seen one in five, but the most common is one in, one in seven. And this isn't counting the queer community, because I want to address that. And if any of you guys don't want to talk about that, just like leave because you guys can all kiss my ass because they have just as much of a right to defend themselves as everybody else does. So I'm a fierce ally for the second amendment in the, in the queer LGBTQ community. Right. End of story. That being said, they Same. tend to skew the numbers a little bit for what those domestic violence survivor number. I'm like, okay, look, like I, I support y'all, but y'all need to like rein in the letters. Cause I can't, <laughs> I'm having a hard time keeping track of the, uh, statistics and like like being able to put this out there because y'all keep changing that shit all the time so the Aaron Paulette and I have that joke you know she's a uh, uh, pink pistols and blazing swords and I'm like I can't keep track of y'all so um but uh so that number tends to be skewed which also tends to skew particularly the gay men number right because that's um that's a huge problem in their community but um so I I went in with the idea that I wanted to to bring women in and, and understand this but particularly last, and I've, I've always been, I'm a feminist, real feminist, not a feminazi. So I believe in equality. So I've always been, it's always been important to me to acknowledge men and the struggles that men go through as well. And the struggles that these wackadoo feminazis put men through. And, um, I think, uh, you and I have talked about that actually, I think a couple of times. And, um, but during domestic violence awareness month, which is in October, I shared the story of a man um in my post and it opened a floodgate for men like it was like i finally gave men that followed me this this validation to be and it just poured out and so i i shared more of those stories and things in fact i probably shared more than women's stories and uh i realized that and i've had men take my class so it's it i'm kind of kicking around do i change the name do i not do i expand it i'm looking at what to do with that um and to make sure that it is encompassing because it is information that um, that is valuable to men too. That being said, women are significantly disproportionately targeted as random victims for crimes, mm -hmm. uh, sexual assaults, um, muggings, that type of thing. Um, so a lot of the situational awareness and defensive mindset stuff definitely is, yeah, it, for lack of, you, know, you want to say more relevance to them, but statistically you know if you're basing it on, on what we see culturally i would say it is so um but no men take my class all the time um some of my biggest uh donors have been men um because they like what i do um particularly because i don't completely blame men interest but as we were talking about with the gun culture and 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 awareness and language and how you said i want to i want to touch on this because this is really important to me and if i can get through to some of y'all this is super without it causing a fight but you had mentioned like some women are not ready to have guns or some women are not ready for that. This, that is true. And what people don't understand is, is that when I post, cause I'll post, um, on social media stories, right. Of the, um, uh, women that are murdered or this, or that, and, and there's a lot of victim blaming, um, that happens where I see a lot of things like, well, that's really unfortunate, but she should have been armed. Well, that's really unfortunate, but it was her choice mm -hmm. to not be armed. And so whether that's true or not, like just take that and put it to the side because I have a lot of domestic violence victims and survivors that are still in their situations that follow me and they're following me. Obviously, right. I'm giving them some, something right to come out and they see that and they'll hide. They won't come out because they, that is, that is reinforcing what they're taught at home, right. That they're programmed to believe is their fault. So when you see articles like this, whether it's something I post or whether it's something I'm talking about or whether it's somewhere else, please be mindful of that and be careful about that language you use because that one particular victim that might be ready to send me a DM because I get them weekly, you know, I need, you know, or I have a friend. Uh, some of it, some of it is I have a friend and then some of it is legitimately, I work with a lady that is X, Y, Z, what can I do? Mm -hmm. um, or college girls leaving their boyfriends. I, that, that's a big one I get. And how, what do I do? So I literally walk them through and sometimes I'm their only resource because they just won't go anywhere else. And it's anonymous or they, you know, uh, not with their friend group or peer group. Um, they, they see that. And so that comment may be the one that keeps that woman from messaging me. And I pray that she's strong enough the next week to do so. And she's not dead.
Yeah, you know, I, and I'll give it to Jeremy. Huh? Uh, I'll give it to Jeremy in here in a second, but I was just going to say, so if if you guys are a victim or somebody that's watching this show or following or not following Carrie, go follow her. Follow her Instagram. Let me tell you, um, I've been watching her Instagram lives here recently a little more often. I'm kind of an asshole, though, just so you guys know. Let me, let's just be clear. Okay? <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't call you an asshole, but I would just call you, you know, you're straight up. You're honest. And that's what we need. We we need to quit bullshitting and trying to beat around the bush. Let's let's say how we feel. And that's, well, you know, that's fun. But yeah, oh, well, different conversation, you know, right? Not hookers and cocaine. Sorry. That's later. That's later, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, follow follow her Instagram. It's really good. Um, there was a good conversation. I think it may be part of the one you're talking about. Um, that you had Star Snoop Dogg on. Uh, another. He came out. Yeah. yeah. A, another amazing story. Um, you know, and I mean, again, uh, crazy life I've had. I've been a victim of domestic violence with a female. Yes. Um, I yes. wasn't beat up or anything like that, but I went through that. And uh, I actually shared it in a Citizens Police Academy thing in front of, you know, 90 percent men and pretty much all the men. You could either see him chuckle or be like, holy crap, this guy actually has the guts to say this. And I'm like, yeah, of right. course, you know, more people need to, you yeah, know, it takes a bigger man to admit that crap than than to hide it. And so fo- uh, what I was going to say is, you know, follow follow Carrie's Instagram, the stilettos mm-hmm. and shotguns, because it's it's really, really huge um to listen to her and just even have the con listen to the conversations between her and guys like kevin dixie or um even steve fisher all and you're going to get plenty of comedy along with it but uh star snoop dog when she comes on with her i mean these stories really really hit home and the one night that i sat i sat in the bedroom for like an hour in the dark because my wife was busy doing work just listening and i was just like really you know i was kind of uh, I don't even know what the word is. Just I really enjoyed listening to the story, how everything came through, and and giving the women and the people, women, men, whatever, gays, straight, I don't give a crap. If you need right. help and you're you're looking for that outlet or you're looking for someone to even just listening to somebody else and being able to relate to them, it's huge. That may give them that strength to be like, hey, you know what? I think I need to reach out to Carrie. I think I need the help. And what do I do? Where do I go? And Man, this seminar I think would be huge for us. Well, I, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And it's it's kind of it's one of these things where people see I'm a very very alpha personality. Clearly, um, I was homeless. I grew up very very poor. Uh, very very like cops episode, like double wide trailer, dog in the front yard, Budweiser cans. They were like legit. Like I'm gonna dig through and find old pictures <laughs> of me growing up and like show like because people don't believe it now. And um, in my 20s, I was homeless. I lived in a I, the salon that I worked in. I, I'm an, I was a nail tech at that time. Um, I lived in, they moved a tanning bed out of this like little, uh, I don't know. I think it was like seven feet long by, it wasn't even, uh, five feet wide. I think it was like four feet wide room and lived there for nine months. So I was homeless. Um, yeah, I didn't have, you know, an address. I had a roof over my head barely, but, um, at work and, uh, I, I'm a, uh, entrepreneur. I'm, I'm a, I own day, a day spa, um, the biggest day spa in, um, the number one in my area, uh, region. And then um, I'm a commercial real estate investor now. So I'm a very, very strong personality. And I, I think for some, the reason I'm telling you guys this is because I think for a lot of women in particular is when they can actually see that the strong woman was the one that was, I couldn't make, like, did you guys watch my speech from the 2A rally? I talk about that. So that, that DC, the rally in, in Washington, DC, the two way rally. I was uh, muted. Sorry. Yeah. I watched part of it. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I actually talk about what happened to me and I was so, I was so emotionally beaten down that I couldn't make a grilled cheese sandwich. Like literally cannot make a grilled cheese sandwich because I wasn't going to do it right, but then I wouldn't do it at all. And then I was in trouble because I wouldn't do it at all. So I think for some, for some women, what's inspiring for them to come out about it is to see, oh, well, she's kind of a, a bad bitch, right? I mean, that's, you know, or I'm whatever. Um, if she, she put up with that, so maybe I'm not as weak as I think I am, right? So, and that, that tends to, and I think uh, Kaslyn stars, she was one of those. And um, you know, she was a dog groomer. Now she's an armed security guard for like the government or, or some crazy thing like that. Um, like, uh, like not like DOD. Anyway, she's doing something. I don't know what she's doing. It's a little. So it's just to watch her grow has been super fun. Um, but I, I think that 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 helps a little bit um, because I'm I'm pretty unapologetic. Um, I'm very opinionated. Uh, <laughs> I'm 
sure you're shocked, but uh, um, I will also be there to, to help you get the support and, and, and resources that you need. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to babysit you to a certain degree, right? If you keep telling me the same story over and over and over again, that means you're not ready. Um, I will be there. And when you are ready, I, I will, I will lead you through and, um, but I will be patient and I will listen and I will give you the resources, but I, I can give you the resources, but I can't, I can't make you do it. So, um, but until you're ready, I'm there. So, and you can come and you just listen quietly and watch and listen to Steve be a butthole and Katie and I be horribly inappropriate with each other. Because if you're, I'm telling you, if y'all sensitive at all, don't watch Katie and I, especially <laughs> <laughs> like if you get any PC bone in your body about like race or gender, don't watch Argo J or NOC firearms. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> <You've been born. laughs> we have a good time though it's free Katie entertainment for me. Yeah. Hmm? free entertainment for me you know katie has been uh, an amazing friend and mentor to me and he and i have become buddies and you know we're big history geeks he and i and we understand you know i understand deeply the 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 history of the birth of, of gun control in america um th you know being racist and and he understands the oppressiveness of women, you know, and I actually had, I took a big hit, a black, a young black man was watching and he was very nasty to me. And Katie actually corrected him. I was, you know, women were bought with property as well. You know, I mean, when this country was founded, women were barely status wise higher than, than slaves. You know, we were, we had no rights and, and none of those things. And um, that's just a reality. And it doesn't demean or, or belittle anything that the slave, that, you know, we had with slavery at all, but, um, we get it, we get each other. And we understand how important it is for us to come together, much like Frederick Douglass and the, um, the, the, you know, the, the women who started the, the suffrage movement, right. They came together as abolitionists and, and they helped each other advance. And so we get that together and understand what that means. And, and so we, we enjoy each other's time and he's, he's an awesome guy. You guys should, if you guys don't pay he, that dude will wake you up, man. We call him the preacher. <laughs> I think um, I, I think what people um, oftentimes fail to realize is that um, I guess the path to like gun ownership and through gun ownership for somebody who's been controlled, right, uh, and the victim of domestic violence, um, that's empowerment, and it's the empowerment that really gives people the ability to rise above those circumstances, right? There's a reason your abusive spouse doesn't want you to be able to defend yourself or doesn't want you to have the confidence, right? There's a reason the government doesn't want you to be able to defend itself, defend, defend right. yourself, right? And it, right. It, it's not because on one hand, the government, you touched on it earlier, right? The Supreme Court has ruled that the government has zero obligation to protect you. There yeah. could be a police officer literally watching you get stabbed to death, right? right. On a train, a, a, yep. on a subway in New York City. Watch you, you get be stabbed. On duty. On duty. Do nothing to save your life. And the Supreme Court ruled that that is okay. The police have no obligation to protect you. Three right? times. That's happened three times. Yeah. And at, just, this, yeah. and at the same time, they're like, you don't need guns. We'll protect you. It's like right. you just told us that you don't have the obligation to protect us, right. that you're not going to protect us. You have a, a red flag situation right there in Washington state where uh, the victim of domestic violence red flagged her, her abusive spouse. Um, and I, I wonder on, on some level, did that provide a false sense of security? Right. Yeah, of course it did. That and the restraining order did. You know, my ex was charged with a felony uh, because I was so how badly I was beaten up. The criteria that they used when they arrested him was that I was bloodied. That was like the the grounds for it being arresting him. The char the initial charge was a class three felony, so like the lowest felony charge. Um, he was charged with that in a DUI because they arrested him as he was going down the road. Um, and, uh, he was able to drop it to a misdemeanor. Um, and the reason in Washington state, the reason he was able to do that was because, um, he didn't use a weapon, a physical weapon. It was just his hands. Well, he was a hundred pounds heavier and a foot taller than me. He, you know, lift, lifted me off the ground by my throat and held me off my feet. 
uh, off the off the ground. I and I had um, I'm in the process. It's taking a minute because it's been archived back because it's so long ago, and I never thought I'd need it. Uh, getting in touch with the the county sheriff here to get the um, my photos, uh, like because I was beat. I was literally beaten head to toe. I've got crowns on my teeth. Um, this side of my face now um, kind of droops a little bit because I took so much more of a hit to this side. Um, so the muscles aren't aren't quite as strong. Um, that's, that's the work I had done. So lift it back up. <laughs> I couldn't be here last week. <laughs> I'm just gonna let's just be real. I'm just, let me just keep it real with y'all. Um, you know, I have tendon damage in my ankles and stuff. Um, but they they dropped it to a misdemeanor. And abusers are narcissists. And what people don't understand about narcissism or sociopathy is they're usually it's rare that they're not really, really, really intelligent. Um, they're some of the smartest people around. And, um, so he knew how to work the system. And so he was able to get that, that initial felony charge dropped to a, um, um, uh, diversion agreement. Even though I told his district attorney who was a female, the prosecutor was a female. And I told her that I would, um, testify against him. And she refused that talk, tried to talk me out of it. And really what it comes down to is because it comes down to her win loss record, right? Because she doesn't want to be there. So she's putting in the time and she, so it's about her win loss record. And so with a diversion agreement, it shows a win in her category. And so then he stalked me. He would sit, he took a, had a day job, but then his night job, he got a pizza delivery driving job, dry, delivery driving job to say that um, he had to be in my neighborhood because that was his territory and he'd sit. So, and then I began to realize he was everywhere. But there was nothing I could do because he was sitting right outside of the thousand feet or whatever it was. And um, we we have this culture that continues to disarm us and tell us that we need to rely on them. They've already told us that it's not their responsibility. Now, particularly for domestic violence survivors, throw on top of that a judicial system that's broken and consistently continues to fail these victims. And now you have every reason why women are continuing to die at the hands, right? Because there are male abused, there are male domestic violence there. It's much less likely for them to die from it, right? Than a woman. Um, but that being said, uh, what the statistics that the gun grabbers use are completely false. And, and I'd like to throw that out there for those that are having these conversations when you're going about this. Um, the statistic they love to use is that a domestic violence victim is five times more likely to die when there's a firearm in the home. Um, okay. A, they're not telling you it's by firearm. And B, they're not telling you that that's not when they actually die. And I actually have uh, Steph Lord, Stephanie Lord gave me a, she, she's helped me with this because she's a survivor too. Um, it's, it's hard to find statistics on how many women have saved their lives because there's a firearm in the home. Typically it's just compiling news articles as they come out. Um, but it's, it's been really difficult. So if you guys get those, send them to me because I, I do save them. I post them, but I, I'm trying to actually compile them. Um, and archive them so that we can start to get a number. It's going to take years. But uh, the most dangerous time for a victim is not when she's in the home. It's when she tries to leave the home. And that's when that's when it gets dangerous. There's never been a story that I've come across where she's died being in the home. Every single news story I've come across is when she's tried to leave. And I know that personally, I, the county sheriff here told me when he was released, they said to me, we suggest that you not be home for three or four days because that's when they're the angriest. So I had to be displaced with my daughter from our home. And of course I didn't have any place. Um, I didn't want her seeing me as bad as I was either. So she stayed with a friend for three or four days. She was five, uh, four. She was four when it happened. Um, and I stayed with a friend, um, but I had to really find some place that he wouldn't find me at all. And I ended up staying on a boat. <laughs> You know, fortunately, we got a lot of water up here. So, um, but yeah, it's, um, but yeah, so they, I mean, they know it, right? They told me that the, the police told me that yet this narrative is still being told that this is the case. And, and so domestic violence victims and children are huge, huge pawns for domestic violence control or domestic violence. I mean, gun control. And it pisses me off. And um, anytime I can get a lane to talk about that outside of the gun community, 
like if anybody who watches this, like if you know people, like newspaper interview, I will I will take any of that because I've got to get that that information outside of the gun community because we get it in the gun community, right? But anything outside of this, it's so important to get that message out there. Yeah, I think there, the domestic violence issue, it, it's layered and compounded by emotions and psychological abuse and emotional abuse. Um, and I, I'd imagine um, that the majority of individuals in that in those circumstances, they know how bad it is. And they probably they often they, they might think to themselves that it couldn't be worse. Um, but, but I, I wonder, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they fall short of thinking that it would culminate in, in that violent, right. That violent act that takes their, takes their life or their kids' lives, lives, um, which, you know, might lead to an inclination of, well, if I just stick around it, it's not going to get any worse than this. I've done, right. I've, I've put up with it. Right. Um, right. if I do try to leave, that's only going to make it worse. Um, and, and let's exactly. let's be honest. Like domestic abusers are are manipulative, and they very. they create a, a power structure within the home that makes yep. it very difficult for the abused person to get out of it. Right? Like how 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 many times does a um, the victim of domestic violence leave with nothing, no yeah. no money? Right? Because the yeah. the the abuser has the money in the bank account. Um, no credit cards because they're not allowed to have that. Um, no job skills because no, I don't want you to work. Right. And then here you are 15 years into a relationship and you know, you haven't worked for the last 15 years. Uh, and the last 10 years of that has been, been abuse. Right. right. Um, so now you're in a situation where the victim is, is literally stuck and has no power and has yeah. no control. Um, and then what they do is they, it gets bad enough. So they call the police the police arrest them the next day they're out with the piece of paper that says, Hey, this guy that just beat you to a pulp, isn't allowed to come within 500 feet of you. And, and the cop will tell them, pissed. yeah, he's pissed because how dare you put me in jail? Exactly. And embarrass me. My ex told me. Yeah. How dare you put me there? How dare you put yeah. me there? And the police yeah. will tell them, Hey, you don't want to be around this guy at all. And it's probably right. not safe for you to be in this house. Mm-hmm. Yep. Get what you can in the car and get the heck out of here. Um, yep. So it's so it's we a, get this place from our homes, and typically they can find they end up finding us. The women go back. That's the one that a lot of people have a hard time with. Is I just don't understand why they go back, because they think you have to understand that they've been beaten down. It's not like they just don't get drunk one night. Billy doesn't just get drunk one night and and punch you know Barbara in the face. That's not how it works. He has spent months, weeks, months, and years breaking her down mentally first. So she already thinks it's her fault. And so when you get into those situations like that, um, she will often go back because he, she believes it's her fault. And if she just hadn't have raised her voice, if she hadn't have asked him to take the garbage out, if she hadn't, you know, whatever, then it would have been okay. So next time I won't do that. Right. And so that's when they come back in and after they're angry, right. Cause it's this whole cycle. Then it's the honeymoon phase where they're they're really nice to you and they treat you like you're their mm-hmm. queen and, and this and that and other. There's no there's no coincidence that the usually the doctors that are on staff the day after Thanksgiving and the day after Christmas are domestic violence specialists. Mine was because I was mine was the day after Thanksgiving, and um, I went in and and I sat there and and uh, uh, they said um, how long has he been beating you? And I said this was the first time I lied. It was the second time she knew it. Um, fortunately for me, it was only the second time. Uh, which is sad to say, but um, three years, four years, four years before that, he had done it once before. And I said, if you ever fucking touch me again, you're going to jail. And I, I held, I held to that, which, but I almost didn't. And, and during the whole time, right, I, I did it, right. But the whole time and during the whole process, I kept thinking, why did you do this? Why did you put yourself in this situation? You made it like I kept, it, it, even Self, me, right? Self compromise. Knowing that I did the right thing, but it still messed with me. Yeah, self compromise really is the way I like to put it. Oh. You know, you're you're compromising with yourself. You're trying to make it's it's yeah. much like you know the mass shootings, and we don't have to go down that road. But you hear loud right. bangs, and what does you do? Your brain automatically goes to oh, somebody dropped a box or something like that. It's kind of the same thing. Like oh, well, like I said, you know, if I wouldn't have if I wouldn't have raised my voice, if I would have made dinner at four instead of four fifteen, you know, maybe that wouldn't have been happened. But the other thing, not only that, is um, the one thing that we miss a lot is you know 
we still love that person. Right. You know, the right. love is involved. And, you right. know, going, going back to your conversation you talked about earlier was, a, you know, about the guys, because I see it too. Oh, she should have bought a gun or she, she, she needs to get training or all that other bullshit. Right. Well, the thing that, the thing that everybody forgets is you're having to, you're having to put it yourself in the mindset of possibly taking the life of somebody you love. Right. And right. people, people don't get that. People don't understand it. If you've never been in that situation, you don't understand. You love this person and this person right. is beating the hell out of you, but the, your love just doesn't stop. Like, okay, he's beating me up. My love's over for some. Right. It does, but for most don't. Right. And it's still your fault. Remember. Right. And you know, it's like you're talking about the financial, the financial thing. So I owned a business and it opened my own business. And there's a lot of components that, that led mine to this, right. Cause that's always the way it is. But, um, I was, I made more money than he did. And, uh, and, and when that, that was the big thing that really made him feel threatened is when I had gotten to the point where I was making more money than him, he was really, really threatened by that. And, um, which made my, made the abuse at home worse. Um, then he would be really, he'd say manipulative things to my daughter as a toddler. And, you know, um, because he wanted me, um, home more. And so I was trying to juggle this. So I'd work these 12 hour days and I was working three, 12 hour days. I was in school. No, I think I was out of school by that point. I think I was finally out of school, but um, I was. And, uh, um, but he would say things like, you know, she would want to jump on me as soon as I came home. Wait, right. If you're a kid, you know how this works. Right. And I would say, just give mom a few minutes. And he'd say, come here, mommy, or come here. Emma, mommy doesn't want to deal with you right now. You know, mm -hmm. like that manipulative shit. He was manipulating her. And, um, so that's, that's, that's what happens if people don't realize that it's this whole thing. When I was giving my speech in DC, uh, one of my friends that was in the audience, she heard a guy in the audience say, I just don't understand why the first time he hits them that they just don't leave. And I can guarantee you, guarantee you, I would place a bet, a huge amount of money on it in Vegas that that, that guy is abusive. I have yet to come across anybody that's ever said that, that isn't abusive or is not being abused and they're in denial that they're being abused themselves because they're not being hit. Mm. That it's, that it's, they're, they're, uh, what's that projecting? So that yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's, um, so we were, you know, we, we started the show with the preface that we were going to talk about changing victim and out uh, the seminar. Um, but I, I think that it's, okay. um, I, you know, I, I want to make sure we're giving you the service there, but I think this is um, a, a good a conversation that needs a, to happen. Um, and because I, I, I would, you know, again, this is me kind of just, uh, you know, guessing, right? I don't know um, if you if you gather statistics on it, but I, I'd imagine that a large percentage of the the people that attend this seminar. Um, do you know how many people, how many people that attend this, this seminar are in an abusive relationship or most of them, were they in a, in the past an abusive relationship and they don't want to repeat them as repeat the, the habits um, and the trends that, 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 that sounds very victim blamey. Um, no, 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 I get you. No, cause it is, it's a pattern. Um, you have to remember most of the people that brought me in are gun store owners. So, um, but that being said, if one in three women are being abused and I had 61 women in that class. Statistic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, th there was, a, you know, a third of that class had had some sort of abuse. Um, some of them have gotten out of their situations. Some of them were there, I think, because they were maybe looking like subconsciously even, or their friend brought them. That's a big one. Right. Um, oh, let's go take this concealed carry class you know, with this, this underlying message to it. Um, that's why I really would like to utilize, um, every opportunity that people are able to present to get this class, this workshop, if you will, out of the gun community specifically. Um, I ended up becoming a gun rights advocate accidentally because of how things played out for me. Um, which is great. I mean, I'm not complaining about that at all because I am a, fierce constitutionalist and I believe that we need to, you know, defend our constitutional rights. And it, and it gave me a very unique voice as a feminist um, to do that. Um, so I, I have no problem with that. But it, 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 the good and the bad of it is that everybody who's been incredibly receptive to bring me in has been gun, gun culture people. Um, but I really need uh, to be able to get that lane outside of there. 
for me here, fortunately, quickly, and then we can move on. I'm sure we've got a couple of questions even um, from people. But um, here in Washington State, we have an organization called Violent Crime Victim Services, VCVS.org. And it was started in 1993 by a gentleman whose daughter was murdered. And they do advocacy They're called for people called co-victims. And co-victims are people who have lost a family member to a violent crime. More often than not, it tends to be gun violence. Um, so they go in with the families to advocate while the murder trials are going on or, or these types of things. And um, the short of it is he found out about my program, loved it, and has endorsed it. And that's a huge endorsement for me. Um, in fact, I'm putting up the event tonight. So if you guys, I, if you know people in Washington State, um, please share this because I'll put the event up on Stilettos and Shotguns and We the Female tonight. But they are actually, it's the first time because I've been a little bit of a pariah in my neighborhood because of the G word. And everybody assumes what I teach is about using guns. I'm like, it has actually what I teach has very little, if anything, to do with guns in general. Um, but uh, uh, in Tacoma, February 15th, I'll be teaching um, my class. Um, and he's actually invited the thousand, one, over 1,000 previous um, clients that he's had for the past 30 years. Now, obviously, we're not going to get that many there, but a church found out about it and loved it um, when I'm doing it, and they're the ones hosting it. So it'll be in like a, so we've got seating. It'll be, you know, I'm expecting maybe 30 or 40 people, which is fine. It's It gets more than 50, 60. It starts to get a little bit, like the, the dynamic of the class changes a little bit, which I can handle. But it becomes more of a lecture than kind of a, a workshop kind of a thing. But um, that's so this is a really good opportunity for me to start getting this voice outside of just specifically gun culture um, and into some of those other areas. I've been very blessed. I can't say who yet. Um, I'm trying there, particularly the, the individual. Um, he's hard to nail down. But um, I have been given a grant um, for travel expenses for six states. Katie has taken one. So Kevin Dixie's taking one. I'm, so I'll be in St. Louis. Looks like Houston is picking one up. Um, and then I've got some other, uh, Colorado might take that second one. So I've got, I, I have that option available, um, which is nice because I, I don't get paid to do this. It's, you know, I pay to do it, which is fine. I, I, I have no problem with that. But um, they believe in what I'm doing so much that I'm grateful to, for, to this organization and y'all know who it is. So when I announce it, you'll be like, Oh, that's cool. Um, but, uh, um, that, that they believe that we need to get this message out there. So, um, if you have connections to women's organizations, domestic violence shelters, um, you know, let's, we can work together to get that message out there because we need to get women to understand that they do not have to settle for depending on anybody but themselves for their own, um, safety and security. That's awesome. I mean, we have Stephanie Lord out here, so, uh, you know, feel free to come to New Mexico. Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> I talked to her about that. Um, I love Stephanie. I think she's great. And, um, yeah, if, if domestic violence shelters, they're hard to get in with too, because they're very anti-gun, very, they're very victim me, right? They, they, they domestic, uh, uh, not all of them, not all of them, because there's one in Reno that's run by a guy, uh, Jake, uh, Wickstrom, who's great. Um, and he's actually had me on his podcast, a mental health podcast, because he about red flag laws and they get it there. I'm, I'm hoping to get in there um, with him. But um, it's it, it, domestic violence shelters, typically speaking, they earn they these people are earning their paychecks by encouraging victim mentality. So it's really difficult to get in because they believe it themselves. Like even the people running it believe that, you know, and I mean, some of them go so far as like you know, they're like super bash the patriarchy man hating crap, which is horrid because ladies love your men. Love your men. We're smarter than they are. You've got it. You just you know, love us. Just love us and pity us at the same time. please. Just humor them sometimes <laughs> and just make them dinner. It's not mm -hmm. going to hurt you. Okay. God. <laughs> yep. So, but, it, and, and, and it's, um, it, it, that's it's it's a little bit challenging to get in with them, but like community organizations, service days. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that this can be implemented in in communities. Um, you know, because it's about um, about your own protection, not about um, there. There's ne never been anybody, and I, I challenge everybody to do this. Ask anybody you know 
if they think that our judicial system is not broken. And there's a, not a single person that I will ever ask that does not agree that we have a broken judicial system. So usually the best way that I, metaphorically speaking, disarm them, excuse the pun, is when I say to them, so if you, if we, if you believe we have a system that's broken, why do you want to continue to put laws in place that inhibit my ability to defend myself when that very system that you already believe is broken is continuing to allow people to, to, it, to like me, to continue to be victims. That usually stops them. Like, boom. Like, if you want to get in the, like, you want to end the gun control conversation with somebody, real quick, do that. Do you believe we have a broken judicial system? Well, yeah, it's a mess. But I mean, right, they'll get ready and say, so why do you want to continue to put laws in place that, that continue to take away my ability to defend myself when they can't do it? I think with that, there's a, um, I think one of the things that gives gun control the power that it has is less about how guns save lives and more about um, like a, like a team mentality, because typically speaking, um, historically speaking, not, not, not historically speaking, the perception is that the second amendment is for me, people that look like me. Right. Right. And right. not not for people that look like you, and not for people right. that look like Andy, right? Oh, it's definitely not Andy. Yeah, it's for the, uh-huh. yeah, not for bald people. Wall, yeah, <laughs> you can't have hair, you can't have a gun, right? Yeah. I think the perception has been, and and for gun control advocates, I think they do a great job of of furthering this this mentality and this perception that gun control or, or guns, the Second Amendment, is for old white dudes, right? Right. Um, because the NRA, everybody assumes. If you talk to anti-gun people, they always, if you hear anti-gun, they, or they, when they talk about gun nuts, it's always NRA. Yeah. And I've been working actively to break that stereotype. And I don't know what the NRA is doing. I, I don't know if that that's who they're pandering to because they, I, I didn't know they helped out with, uh, was it Shanine Allen? Um up oh, in, yeah. Black yeah, girl. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize that they were involved in, in fighting for her. That should have been that should that that shuts all of that stuff down. You so think? why did yeah. why did they suppress because the, they're marketing the people are fucking dumb. That's yeah. why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah because yeah. they're fucking right. stupid. Because if they were smart, they'd have people like Andy and I up there. Did, That's right. uh, do you guys know about um I Jeremy, you probably don't. Andy, do you know about when I confronted Willis Lee at Shot Show last year? No. And what Tell happened with that? that? So Katie was presenting his fire his truth pistols, which I have number one. For those of you that don't know, um, you know about those ones. I actually have serial number one. I was the first one to order it. Um, and yes, I totally brag about that because it's awesome. And not only because I supported my friend, I believe in what he's doing. <laughs> I was going to say me. not so humble brag. Not at all. You can't <laughs> not so humble at all. I have number one, just so y'all bitches know. Um, <laughs> he actually made me cry when he did that. I was not expecting him to do that. And uh, um, because of the prototypes, right? But no, I have the first retailed one. So he, he that was actually by law. I guess. But anyway. Anyway, he made me cry because he didn't make a big to do of it. But um, he, Willis Lee was standing there and um, somebody said, oh, that's the, right. Because remember, I didn't even know what shot show, well, like I showed up and I was like, what the hell is this thing, right? I, a year ago, I didn't even know that existed. Well, now I did, but barely. Um, I walked in there and went, Jesus, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, so I, I, I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, you're the, you're the, because I, I think at that time, I don't know if he still is, he was their director of outreach or something like that. And I said, and I handed him my card and I said, I'm Carrie Sloan, I'm founder of the We the Female, a domestic violence survivor, and you you need me. We need to talk because we need to address how you guys are, are, are the conversation around how you are dealing with women in firearms. And his, I, I was, I, so he looked up at me because <laughs> I was in heels and I, he was, I was taller than him. So he looked up at me and he said, yeah, that's exactly how you're going to get me to talk to you is by talking to me that way. And wow. he turned to walk away from me and I touched his shoulder and I pulled him back like this and he turned around to look at me and I said, your shitty attitude right now is exactly why you need to talk to me. <laughs> and he, you know, like a little kid went like this and, and walked away. And Laura and Colleen Smith was standing there, um, liberal gun owners. And she said, he needed, somebody needed to do that to him. And I said, well, why haven't you done it? And she just stepped back. And then I met Tim Knight. And that's how I met Tim Knight. Cause he was standing there and Tim Knight said, <laughs> uh, somebody needed to say that to him. And I'm glad it was you. I'm Tim. And, and then he had me his car from the NRA board. And I was like, really you're one of them right because right (laughs) and uh uh, so then i found out who tim really is which is the illuminati and uh 
<laughs> literally. <laughs> and uh, so Tim, Tim, of course, is a very good friend of mine now. I adore Tim. He's usually one of my go-tos when I need need help or advice and support. And we just run stuff off of each other sometimes. Yeah. And uh, But he's uh, you guys have to understand, before I was a gun community person, I was a gun owner and a fierce gun owner and was very anti. I have a very unique perspective of NRA. I was very anti-NRA. My husband and I gave up our, our memberships three, four years ago, long before I knew that, like when my post went viral and two weeks later, I'm like, shit, there's a whole world of these people. Like, where did this come from? I had no idea there was a culture, right? And I makes sense and no idea, no idea this existed. And um, so we gave up our, and we, because we hate lobbyists, despise lobbyists. And that's all we saw them as was this big lobbyist group that had become corrupt and was like full of shit and, you know, and all this kind of thing. Then I get in to the gun culture. And I see that there are actually things that the NRA does. Like I, like ILA, I had no idea that existed. I'm like, Oh, like there is actually some things that the, the NRA does do that is very, very important and very mm-hmm. vital and not bad at all. Mm-hmm. So what I've come to realize is that's not what needs to go. It's that executive branch that needs to be replaced and they need a whole house cleaning and a douching as it were, um, to get rid of the douches. <laughs> yep. Um, and so, uh, I, I have a very unique perspective that way. Being somebody who was anti-NRA coming into the gun world and then saying, whoa, 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 we, there, there needs to be some conversation around this. But definitely their marketing component of that is is a, a giant disaster. And I don't foresee that changing, unfortunately, anytime soon, um, which is which is sad uh, because actually if, if any time they need to be doing it, it's, it's now. Yeah. Hey, Carrie, just a, a, a thought popped in my head. Have yeah. you ever, and <laughs> don't laugh, but have you ever tried going to Moms Demand Action and trying to get in to be like, hey, let me, let me talk to you guys a little bit about my experience and what I do. And, um, I, so, um, yes and no. I've tried to reach out to them through social media, which mm-hmm. is a network. People laugh about that, but I think that's a legitimate way to get a hold of people now. Right. Um, I've been blocked everywhere. It's almost about the only way. Huh? It's almost about the only way. <laughs> In some in some cases, yeah, uh, yeah, because we have a, a state representative here who's not in my district, and so her people weren't returning my messages, and so she had commented on on a tax thing up here because I have her. She's in my area, and we have mutual friends, like personal friends, and uh, so I she popped off about some taxes, and I said, you know, it'd be. I said, do you not refer to yourself as a leader? You are not my leader. You are an elected representative, and the language about who you are needs to change with you. Mm-hmm. I said, and it would serve you well to remember that you're representative and return people's emails when they send them to you instead of ignoring them. And I actually left that. I, I screenshot that. Um, and I left it on social media and boy, did I get a message back quick then. So, yeah. and so then she messaged me and then I received this fuck off essentially um, email from her staff, right? I can tell you, she didn't even read my email that I resent her to at the top, but resent per your request. And, um, so I responded back to it and I said, you know, thank you for responding. However, I think it's really disappointing that you've chosen not to, to see me. I realize you have no obligation as I'm not in your district. However, I'm bringing a conversation about gun control to this, that you really, as a Republican, you really need to be hearing. And I, I've got some stuff that you really is going to help benefit you in this fight when you're telling me that you're behind enemy lines and your message as a Republican. Um, so I, I email it to her. I sent it to her in a Facebook DM. Then I went on her timeline on her wall on Facebook. And I said, uh, Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I responded to that email. And since you were having such a challenge being able to receive my, my emails, I just wanted to let you know that I sent it to you in a DM too, just to make sure that you get it. Nice. And guess, guess who I got uh, an email back from. So from her personally, not her staff. So yeah, the, use Facebook, but you know, it's, I say always, always try to be a resource and not an adversary um, until you have to be, then call them out. Right. But, but don't, don't go in with that. And I'm kind of an a-hole. Like if you follow me, people think that I go in with, with both barrels, you know, wide open blazing. And if I don't, um, I may talk a lot of shit on, online and stuff, but when I'm dealing with these people individually, nah, like you've got to be like, d- don't go and be an asshole or you're not going to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Educate them. I, I sat with another state Senator here and, and she wasn't completely anti-gun, but she wasn't pro gun. She was, she's running down the middle and she's a Democrat. Uh, she's the only one that responded to me, interestingly enough. Um, and I sat down with her and, and talked to her and she, there were some things that we agreed on and didn't agree on. I said, have you ever shot a gun? And she said, only, shotgun skeet shooting 
and I said, so you know that they're not the horrible things people would make them out to be. She goes, no, but it's things surrounding it that we can make better because she's all about the capacity uh, uh, magazine ban. And I educated her about that. So I pulled out a baggie with, with rounds in it. And uh, I had a 22 all the way up to a 308. And um, I said, this little round 22 in that assault weapons ban bill that you guys have on the table, you have guns in that bill and want to ban guns that are as, as assault rifles with this size round, but not with this one. And she just stopped and went like this. And I went, like, you guys don't get that this is not what you think it is. And it, it stopped her. And then with the magazine ban, this is a great one for y'all, because this is really the only argument we have. Steve Fisher actually helped me with that. Steve Steve went through, we sat on the phone for about an hour together, and I went through the um, the laws, and I read the things, because that dude knows guns. Like, he's wearing man of the guns, man. <laughs> like, hey. everywhere in the world. Like, he just know, you know. He's all right. Doing this. So, <laughs> and so he helped me kind of create that language. Yeah, he's pretty fly for a white guy. Crotchety old man. Um, so he... Uh, he um, helped me with some of that language and I'm waiting for my, if he's still watching anywhere, I'm waiting for my little thing showing up with a, with a text message. Uh, <laughs> he went through that and then we, he sent me a video to show her about, right. Cause the, the concept with this magazine ban thing that they're after is that if they limit the capacity, it takes, this is literally the logic that they have, that it takes them longer to reload therefore saving lives. So I showed her the video of somebody who was not like Steve sent it to me. And this person was not, I, they were not an expert. I mean, like my husband and Steve and maybe you guys, I mean, I don't know. My husband is 0.5 seconds, right? He's military. He's been doing that forever. He's quick. Uh, Steve probably 0.5, you know, you guys are probably under a second, you know, for half second, three quarters of a second. So worst case scenario, we're looking at, you know, three seconds. Well, Steve sent me one of a guy who was, was not completely amateur, but he wasn't an expert. So it was about a minute or excuse me, second, second and a half. So I showed her that video and she went real quiet. And I said, that is somebody who's got, knows how to shoot a gun, but isn't necessarily an expert. So if he were completely inexperienced, it would be maybe three to five seconds, maybe five seconds, most likely three. I said, so you're talking about someone who's wearing three magazines at 10 rounds a piece on their waist. And she's, I mean, at this point she looks at me, she goes, yeah. I said, so they're having to change that. And you're, you're saying that that time is going to save their life. She says, well, yeah. And I said, do you think that nine seconds is going to save somebody's life when it takes the cops at best case scenario, 10 minutes to show up? And she had nothing. Mm -hmm. She couldn't even get emotionally defensive. She just went quiet and she sat there. I said, you know who you will hurt? You will hurt me because I keep a 30 round capacity in my AR and I choose an AR in my home because my AR is light. I'm accurate with it because I can brace it against my shoulder. There's less recoil and there's going to be less collateral damage. I am not strapping up three 10 round magazines in the middle of the night when I've got multiple intruders coming in my house. I need all 30 rounds ready to go. I said, you're going to be hurting someone yeah. like me who chooses an AR as a, as a, as a means for self-defense. You also hurt competitive shooters, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And she had nothing like she didn't get shitty. Yeah. She didn't get mad, which means that I planted the seat. So could she still vote for it? Sure. But at least she's not going in blind. And that's the best I could do, you know, at that situation. So, um, yeah, that's that's what. Well, so educate people before you blow them up, then blow them up. Like if they turn in dicks, let, them, let it go. <laughs> and I'll be more than happy to help you write it. <laughs> it's, it's like what, what gets them right in the, in the, you know, the anti-gun groups, they come prepared, right. And they come in force. Andy and I, down so. at this Bay than... and we, uh, we had spoken at in opposition of a couple bills they were trying to pass. And uh, there they were the anti-gunners. They had, they had leaflets, they had bullet point, bullet pointed lists for the, for sure. the, on the committee. Right. Um, and then our side got up there and we were flat footed, right? We were speaking of, you know, there were guys up there that were speaking in opposition to this bill. And they had some points that were the anti-gunners had already thought out and, and planned yep. for. And they, yep. they said, hey, those points that they just brought up don't even apply to this bill because we're not touching that stuff. We're not doing that stuff. Right. 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 So it, our side looks like we don't know what we're doing. Right? Exactly. So we, and, they, and they're capitalizing on it. And, you know, we get a bunch of people up there with guns, gun owners. They're like, well, this is the my Second Amendment right. And they're reading all that because like, I just went and testified in, in uh, um, Tacoma. Right. I don't even live in Tacoma, but I testified because uh, they put a gun and ammo tax there. 
and they knew what they were, we knew. I mean, it was unanimous. They knew what they were, they were going to pass it. They, interestingly enough, every single one of them, all eight of them, including the mayor, also admitted before they voted to pass it that they didn't know what they were voting on and how it was going to affect people. Like they all admitted it. They didn't fucking care because that's how, that's how they've gotten. Right. Um, But the arrow, right. Probably at least at a minimum, 25% of arrows employees showed up to speak. I mean, that room was packed pro gun and uh, pro pro uh, gun rights and, and not so much on the other side. I mean, they were, they were outnumbered five to one easily. Um, but they, some, some people had really good points. I went in, you know, with my, you know, why are you not fixing your system? You know, I went in with my very powerful talking points and I said, and if you're, if you're, you know, and this is, I went in like putting ammo tags in place. What about women who ride the bus? They can't, you know, if your thing is, well, they can leave the city to buy their ammo if the cost is, but not if they ride the bus. Like you're literally targeting, uh, uh, marginalized groups of people, right? You're tar- you're targeting. I hate to use the word minority because nobody's really a minority anymore. But my brown people, right? My brown people, my black people. You're you know if they live in the in an urban area where they don't have transportation, you know they may rely on bus for transportation. Or if they are low income, because uh, spoiler alert: white people, not all black people are poor. <laughs> <laughs> not all brown people are poor people. Yep. Um, contrary to like some sort of like weird, bizarre gun world structure, sometimes I, to what I hear the NRA people, right? Um, not everybody. So nobody, nobody come at me in the DMs. But, Monday, <laughs> fuck off. but I'm speaking like, this is like, like Andy's laughing. Cause it's kind of true. Right. <laughs> no, it's like, very we true. See this stuff, huh? It's very true. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but you know, you've got single moms, you've got domestic violence survivors living in the cities where the apartment where they can get to work by bus. And I said, you're marginalizing them. And if your argument then is to tell me that, well, the, the ammo tax isn't that much, then why are you putting it in place to begin with? If it's not that much. So, um, I, I came in and there was a few of us that had a really formidable argument, but so many of them got up there and were like, well, this is my constitutional right. I'm like, Jesus Christ, we fucking know. Like if you leave a comment ever in one of my social media things that says shall not be in French, literally the response is going to be, we fucking know. Like <laughs> and it's just being, stop with that. And it's being infringed every day. Every do And spoiler alert, everything but the third amendment has been fr- infringed upon in this country. Right. Every third and 10th, but they're using the 10th against you right now. If you don't know what it is, get the goddamn app. It's free for your phone. <laughs> Educate yourself on what the constitution is. Uh, but they're using the 10th amendment right now. The federal government is using the 10th amendment to take away your rights so that then they can backdoor it and do it federally. Mm-hmm. So that's a whole other conversation. I could geek out about the constitutional <laughs> but, uh, and how it's being manipulated against us. But um, yeah, like, can you get a permit uh, to, or can, do, can you speak in a park with a, a, bunch, a group of people without a permit? Right. No. You've been infringed forever because you got lazy and complacent and you fucking let it happen. Yeah. All of us. We the yeah. people, one of the best questions I've ever been asked in a live stream. Best question. I've actually written a little blog post and I want to get it published, actually. Um, I don't know why I can sit and talk all day or give speeches, but to like publish, like it's a huge insecurity. But I've got this thing written to as an op-ed um, based on this question, which is what do you believe is the biggest threat to our liberty? And it is we, the people, Us, yeah. you know, literally become our own worst enemy. And it's been from what I've come up with are these, what I call the three C's. We've been complacent, complicit, and contrary. And those three things have allowed us to, or allowed the government to think that they're delusional enough to think that they are our leaders as opposed to our elected representatives. Mm-hmm. And because of that, they have gotten us exactly, we have put ourselves in the situation that we are in. End of story. We have the government we have allowed to happen. That's the difference between a democracy and a republic. We're a republic, remember. We're not a democracy. So we have allowed this to happen. And now we're behind the eight ball, the proverbial eight ball, trying to get back out of this now. And it's it's frustrating and not perfect. So, um, yeah. I told y'all I could keep talking. Like y'all keep me on forever. Right? No, it's good. I, I think we could keep talking. I want to get back. I want to circle back to the church shooting because you said that's something that you wanted to talk about. Um, and it's... Yeah. Um, I think it's something that we wanted to talk about, and I don't know if we wanted to do. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of other folks that out there that have talked about it, but it is something that we wanted to discuss on a, on a show as well. So um, there was a question I want to get to. Ruben had asked the question um, about um, what about when you get accused of domestic violence and it's not the case? So you, when you're falsely accused of domestic violence, um, yeah. and this isn't to take away from any of the previous discussion that we had, right? right? Because no. The as a feminist, I deal with that topic. I deal with that topic a lot as a feminist, and I acknowledge it, um, which is rare for a lot of domestic violence survivors. But I do acknowledge that it does happen, 
And that is why I'm that weird, rare domestic violence survivor that not only is pro 2A, but will, because even a lot of us that are pro gun as domestic violence survivors will still be that man, will be that man blamer or that, um, well, fuck them. They should have their guns taken away until blah, blah, blah. No, uh, if you're accused of domestic violence, you are still do your process as an American citizen and you're innocent until proven guilty and your firearm should not be taken from you, which is why women should not be perpetuating or should not be in a culture that's perpetuating their uh, victim mentality. Right. So this is where the whole catch 22 is. Right. So I absolutely believe that any individual should is do their process, that you're innocent until proven guilty. That's difficult when we have this culture that's continued to encourage women to be victims. Right. So um, there's no easy answer to that. Um, But that's it really is going to start by even men getting on board with helping to encourage the proper way to reconstruct and 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 uh, what it looks like uh, for women to to take care of themselves and defend themselves, and y'all, uh, you know, gun gunmen are some of the worst, man. Like you guys are, there's a lot of chauvinism and a lot of misogyny going on. Oh yes, in the world. Uh, I just don't have to put up with your asses because I'm gonna <laughs> tell you the fuck right off, right? I just I will. I don't care. But it's also it's also ostrich. You know, I've I've been you know people don't like to play with that. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and interestingly enough, it's more that more um, the conservative women have a hard time with that. I've been called harsh and abrasive. And I'm a little I'm like, but you fucking voted for Trump. Like, mm-hmm. like, so if Trump said it or a man said it, he'd be a leader. Right. So so this is why we still need feminism. And this is goes back to that whole kind of thing. Right. You guys think I'm abrasive and I'm harsh. But if Trump had said I, I'll say some of the same things that he'll say, you know, in, in context or whatever it is or some, in some form of it. And you guys support it with him. But I'm being too harsh and abrasive, uh, conservative women, but you vote, but you're MAGA girls. Mm-hmm. So that is one of those things where feminism is still, we, we do still need that because there is still that culture of a woman is bossy. A woman is bully. A woman is harsh, but a man is a leader. So if, if men, if, if you, we really like in the ideal world, right. If you really want to get to the point where you have men that are legitimately and fairly given their due process, we, that is also going to be benefited from changing the culture of victim mentality so that women have more empowerment to be able to learn how to defend themselves so they're not put in a situation where they feel like they've got to call. And then we can start addressing the women, right? Because if a woman is falsely accusing you, that's abuse, right? So now she's abusing you. And so now we can get to where you as a man, right? Because this is where feminism comes in because it's equality. You as a man can now be more comfortable with coming forward about your abuse and what you're going through so that you can now speak out about it and, and be treated equally as well. So this is why we need feminism, kids. <laughs> be nice to people, right? Don't don't yeah, uh, stop being dickheads. <laughs> be nice to people. Raise better children. I mean, geez, raise better geez. children. Absolutely. Raise better. Whole, man, that's the uh, just be nice to people. Raise better children. Don't. Yeah. Uh, Man, if you're in a relationship and you have to control, like if you're an abusive person, how shitty is your life where you are so insecure with yourself that you have to control another human being to to make you to to give you some false sense of substance and uh, just just be a better person and, and do what makes you happy. Um, stop being a jerk. Jeez, it's fucking yeah. 2020. <laughs> exactly. I'm looking at the comments here and you've got this guy who I think different guy he said yet that is not what happens um some of the time males are destroyed by the victim by victims a majority of time okay i want to i want to i want to walk that back a minute males are destroyed by victims if she is legitimately a victim you fucking deserve to be destroyed yeah and i don't know and if that you're... might be a harsh reality for you sir because maybe that's happening to you and maybe you needed to look at yourself i don't know so i know joel i go back to high school with this guy mm-hmm. um so I, I don't I think that, no, 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 no. I want to, I, I want, I want to, Joel, clarify your comment for us, but I'm, I'm guessing um, that you should not, that you did not like victim, right? Like I a hundred percent agree. Like if you're the, like if the victim, if you're abusing somebody and the victim destroys you, you, you deserve it and all, all right. that, right? Like if you're a spousal abuser, user, you go, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. go, 
go swallow a, a gun, right? Mm-hmm. Go swallow mm-hmm. a high point. Because uh, that's just going to per- further perpetuate the, the ignorance. Right. Um, right. I think with the I think with the victim mentality, if somebody is falsely accused of domestic violence or rape, um, I think victim mentality has led to the Me Too bullshit. The Me Too, a hundred percent, believe the victim a hundred percent of the time because if you right. question it, if there's a shadow of the doubt, you're blaming the victim, mm. which right. leads to right. the the right. the the, who, the the falsely accused person having right. their lives destroyed, right? Because if you're right. arrested of domestic violence and you get a public defender, and that public defender says, "Hey, we're going to plead it down to a misdemeanor. You're not going to spend any time in jail." How many times does that happen? And that public defender oh. or that attorney does not tell that person who is falsely accused, right, but wants to avoid all the hassle because, yeah, I got emotional. It was an argument or whatever. Now, all of a sudden, Always about money. that person who was falsely accused and took the plea deal can no longer has the Second Amendment right to defend himself, right? Like, right. I get phone calls several times a year from people, right, that had that they claimed to be fal- they were falsely accused, right? They were arrested. They pled no contest, right? They agreed to a pre-child aversion. And in the state of New Mexico, that's still convi- considered a conviction, right? If you mm-hmm. plead, uh, like if you take a pre-child aversion, that's still considered a conviction, right? And you cannot do, right? Like you, you can't own guns. You can't get a concealed carry license. If it's a felony, um, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, even no, well, if it's a misdemeanor, if you plead no contest to a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence, you can you can't own federally. You're prohibited from owning firearms. Um, uh, I didn't realize that you were making a state. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because that does happen. Um, that being said, it's. This will probably piss off some of your listeners, but it's very rare that it is a false accusation. Yeah. Mm. Maybe the time that you were finally accused was a false accusation, but what, you know, don't put yourself, don't put yourself in a situation where, where that accusation can hold water. Right. Right. And chances are, if you're with it, that goes back to personal responsibility, uh, defensive mindset of like just your mental, just your situation. Right. Um, If you knew that broad was batshit crazy and you still married her. Your fault. There's there's, there's (laughs) some personal responsibility on that, right? Like yep. you, if you if you went into that saying I'll fix her or she'll change, you kind of put it on your. And I'm not making excuses for their behavior. Let me be clear. Um, but but that goes back to changing the culture of victim mentality, right? Because now you're making yourself a victim yep. by saying, um, "All right," because there should have been signs there, right? There was probably signs there that this this was this person. Now again, not always. There are times like my I have a friend who, when he married his wife, she was great. Uh, she ended up getting wrapped up in drugs and, and they, when they were going through the divorce, he accused, she was accused him of all. I mean, it was awful, awful. And he is and definitely not that guy. It does happen. However, usually in those cases, what I have found over the past year studying this, right? I'm no lawyer, but I, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express one time. So <laughs> <laughs> I actually worked at one. So it's what I see it, not as a hooker, but, uh, <laughs> I or, was or, as, or as a madam, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> What I tend to find is it it, 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 it it can happen, but it's very, very rare that that's the case. And in those rare cases, it is very transparent to judges what's going on. That's been my consistent, like I've not yet found a case where in the, of the rare cases that that is legitimate. I have yet to find anybody where the judge is not seen right through the bullshit. Now that doesn't mean that it's not that doesn't make it okay that 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 she or he whatever in the case is it, that putting you through hell. It's that's it's absolutely not. It's fucking ridiculous. Let me be clear and let me let me validate you because it is. It's absolutely not acceptable. But it is. I find it's very rare that it, that tends to be the case. Um, but it can happen. So but like on the Me Too movement, think quickly and go back to that church shooting. It's a good question though. It's a really good question. And a lot of people don't ask that question as much as they should, honestly. So I'm glad you did ask it. Um, but uh, uh, the the Me Too movement, th- this is where I sit in this really unique position where I see it from both sides, right? As a, as a domestic violence survivor, I and, and seeing how the system is broken and how it continues to fail us or how we get blamed or how these fucking assholes leave these comments in the, the section, right? When she defend herself or 
the there was just recently last year it was a rape case in Alabama where the judge asked her why she didn't close her legs. Like there is legitimately still a reason women don't report because what's wow. the fucking point? Yeah. Because you're not going to believe us anyway, or it's going to be our fault because our skirt was too short, or it's going to be this, or you write blah 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 blah. So that does still exist. However. That being said, I also know that there have been a, a, a significant number of women who have exploited the shit out of that and that Kavanaugh hearing and those women, shame on them, shame on them for at the very least of nothing else, not giving him due process and turning a vague 30 year old sexual aggression, assault claim into a rape. They call him a rapist, right? I mean, this is how extreme that way. So that's, that's not okay. So I, I run this really fine line right down the middle where I literally see both sides of that Me Too movement because I do understand why a lot of women don't report. I do fucking, I fucking get it. I am one of them. Like, what was the point? I put myself through hell to get justice and they screwed me. Absolutely screwed me over. And so what was the point of me doing it, right? So I am legitimately a Me Too. Uh, now, a sexualist, well, there was, he actually did sexually assault me, but it was, you know, in, uh, in, um, conjunction with the domestic violence, you know, the, the physical beating, but, um, it's, it's, so I get it from that side, but at the same time, you do have women that falsely do that shit. And it, it certainly isn't helping. And it certainly isn't that manipulation. Like, this is why men won't trust you. Right. My husband, and I got in a huge fight. I shouldn't say huge fight. It was a heated conversation. That's, that's more about that. When Pence came out and said he would have lunch with women, you know, <laughs> and he's like, I get it. And I said, fuck you. Who the hell, what is that, right? Because my husband's very much a feminist. And because guess what? Spoiler alert, men can be feminists, and you should be. Because um, it's about the philosophy, not about the word. Um, and he... Uh, uh, Jeremy's really feminine, too. Just saying. Are you, are you a feminine? Are you a feminine? No, I do have two daughters. <laughs> um, so. And he said, uh, yeah, see, and it's funny how much more of a feminist you become as a dad of daughters, isn't it? Funny mm -hmm. how that happens. Yeah. Uh, and he said, fuck no. He says, I'm not putting myself in a position where a woman's going to accuse me. And I said, how dare you? Right? I mean, I was pissed wicked pissed then the Kavanaugh thing uh happened and then um there was and I was like he was still a little bit of a disconnect for me honestly owning my own shit it was a little bit of a denial me being stubborn um but then um then there was a reporter in um after the Kavanaugh thing down at it was in Louisiana uh who was pissed that this congressperson down there or senator governor some I don't even know what it was wouldn't have lunch with her without somebody else there and I was like, yeah, I wouldn't either. And my husband went, <laughs> I was like, uh, okay, I get it. You know, so, you so, so guess what, feminazis, you fucking created your own situation by exploiting <laughs> the, and, and making and spinning that shit. It, fuck you, Alyssa Milano. Fuck you, Rose McGowan. <laughs> and actually, that's not fair because Rose McGowan should be screwed. She should piss off for other reasons, but not for that one because she was yeah. actually legitimate. But um, Ro Alyssa Milano, mm, if I ever see her. <laughs> so she just ruined it for women right i mean it's it, anyway i could go on let's talk about the church shooting because i'm yeah. like that's a that, hell that's a thing for me before we get to the church shooting man we really hope you enjoy listening to that episode as much as we did interviewing and having our guests on be sure to share this with your friends and family and head over to patreon.com slash after action project we'd love to have you on as a guest panelist and be sure to check out those other rewards that we have for our patreons if you're a recent graduate of a firearms-related training course and would like to join us on our show, or if you'd like us to review a specific firearm-related training course or instructor, shoot an email to show at afteractionproject.com. Remember to join a local firearms advocacy organization. As always, stay safe, shoot straight, and remember to secure your firearms so that unauthorized persons cannot gain access to them. 